if I'm the establishment. The best thing that I can do is to get them to feel pride with being a broke artist. Mm -hmm. I can make you feel pride for being in the hood, from the hood, and now you're always talking about where you're from as a point of pride as if that makes you better than somebody else, mm. even though a lot of that mentality might be keeping you back and becoming the ultimate threat to me. When you're younger, you, you, you have a lot of false dichotomies. Yeah. So it's like art and commerce can coexist. Right. It's like, says yeah. who? Speak on that. Exactly. You know, says who? Why can't I feed my family and make some money and drive a nice car and live in a safe neighborhood and make art? Like, who says it don't? It, yeah. it can't coexist. But there wasn't really a lot of people getting it on like a lower middle class roots level with, with music. Like, it just didn't seem like that was a possibility. It was either like you were rich, signed to a label, or you were like a struggle rapper. Yeah. And so to carve out this little lower, lower middle class where, you know, I, I, okay, I, I know I got to make three grand a month to cover all my bills all right i could do that you know and i'm not that technical of a rapper so mm. let me go build a tribe outside of the music and then bring them over to the music and this also allows me to then do the sync deals and like where all the real money is at mm. is in the publishing and in the sinks and no one's talking about that right it's like that's where the real like independent money is at. as you could be making you know we were doing six figures off of music pay what's up what's up what's up i'm brand man sean and i'm corey and we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. Yet another episode of No Labels Necessary is about to happen. As y'all know, we love to have people who are doing things differently, building their own path. And today I have a very special guest. We're in his facility, Bless God Studios. I don't know if you call it that, but... But I think that's the perfect name, obviously, knowing your brand. Somebody I, I really admire in many ways. Um, he's an artist. He's an entrepreneur. He's, a at this point, a talking head, a presence on YouTube. And there's so <laughs> much to come. Like I, I see the path and the growth that's going to happen in the future. We are here today with Ruslan. What's up, Ruslan? Appreciate hey, you having Appreciate you on. having me, brother. I'm, yeah, uh, I'm excited dope. to be talking to you guys. Yeah. I watch your guys' podcast. Like, I appreciate it, Like, man. I throw it on, and it'll be on at the gym. And, oh, yeah. that's what's up. Yeah, that's what's up. It's dope. You guys and Curtis King is, like, my go-to for Oh, that's fine. That's a music, big compliment. Music yeah, stuff. man. It's a huge compliment. Yeah, I love to be in that sentence with Curtis. Curtis is dope, man. So, I mean, there's so much that we can speak with, uh, speak about, but like, I I want to make it clear because you have such a unique journey, right? And what you're doing lately is really, when I say you're a great example for the podcast and what we like to talk about and doing things differently, it seems like you found this path where now your creativity and your artistry is a part of what you do. Mm -hmm. And you've created a level of success um, entrepreneurially and as a businessman, which I know you want to continue to build on, mm -hmm. right? You probably don't feel like you've made it, but it seems like you've, crack the sense of a cold just watching you over the last few years but before we get into that right you were an artist in the christian hip-hop space mm -hmm. right what was that like for you and why well one when you were first said hey i'm gonna be a rapper did you think hey i'm just gonna be the biggest rapper in general or did you say you wanted to be in the christian hip-hop space specifically first mm. That's, that's a good question. I think I just wanted to make music in general. Mm. And because I was a Christian, it was like, well, you're a part of this, mm. you know? And then I would do stuff that was not Christian. And it was like, wait a minute, you're a Christian. You can't do that. And then I was like, I guess you're kind of right. I can't, I can't do the shake your booty songs and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Right. I actually okay. had a record like that, like my sophomore year of high school and, and folks were like, what are you doing? You can't, you can't like non-Christians are like, you can't do that. Like you're a Christian. Really? And I was like, that's interesting. I guess you're I like guess that. you're right. Yeah. So no, nah, it was it was it was more organic. Like it wasn't like uh let me set out to be a Christian rapper. It was like I was a Christian. I, I made I loved hip hop. I was doing hip hop before I was a Christian. And then it just kind of all culminated and turned into yeah. what it's turned into. So it sounds like you hit a point where you had to figure out how can I align my real life values with this this thing I want to keep doing exactly yeah, okay. exactly okay. and and so I di I didn't want to be incongruent I didn't want to be different uh, identities mm. I'm a rapper over here and then I'm I'm a I'm a Christian over here. I just thought that was corny and I would meet people like that if folks that mm. come to the church and they mm. you know they they'd have the the chains and the persona and this whole thing and then they'd be like at church and I'm like y'all corny like what is this this just seems mad fake and so I just wanted to be the same person. Got you, got you. Yeah. Okay. that's funny. That reminds me of 
an artist not by the name of Kibo. He's the guy who is like the number one rapper on Fiverr. I don't know if you ever heard about him. I did. I yeah, saw. Yeah, yeah. I saw your. Was it your? Interview I, I did do an interview. Yeah, with him. yeah, yeah. CNBC yeah. covered him, and I remember. I don't know if it was during our interview. It might have been just our personal talks or whatever. But he talked about he was rapping. He doesn't curse in his raps, mm -hmm. and he makes that a plain thing on Fiverr that mm -hmm. if you hire him, he's not going to curse, right? Mm -hmm. Which is interesting that people have problems with that. Like mm -hmm. some of the clients, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. wait, you just you want me to curse? It's right. almost weird to add, ask somebody yeah. to curse explicitly. That's funny. Yeah. But he says the reason he doesn't do it is because when he was younger, he was performing, and his brother came to the show that time. Mm -hmm. And it just felt so weird mm -hmm. because he didn't curse in his real life. Mm -hmm. And his it's like a little brother. Yep. And he was always setting an example. And yep. he didn't curse in real life. And he was doing all that. Like make some MF and noise and yeah. da 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 da. All at his performance. And at that moment, he realized he was being incongruent. Yep. It wasn't about even necessarily religion or anything. It was just yeah. like, I'm not this person in right. real life. Right. <laughs> right. Why am I doing this here? And it kind of right. like rang that bell. And it's interesting. It's just interesting that you had other people kind of call that out in you yeah. and make you see that in yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I just, I've always had solid people around me that just mm -hmm. tell me the truth. And even in high school, people would just, like, when I was like, you know, freshman year, I won this uh, contest at this park down the street called Bringo Terrace Park. And then like sophomore year, we got second place in Battle of the Bands, which was a big controversy mm -hmm. to have. This is 2001, 2000, 2000. Yeah. So this is before. So like we're doing Battle of the Bands. It's all rock bands and like a hip hop group, and we yeah. took like second place, and that was like a big deal. So I've always had people, mm. artistic, creative people around me, and and people that would tell me the truth. Gotcha. You know, and that, that's always been good. It's actually so crazy that you said that because being from the south, black guy from the south, when you said Battle of the Bands, I had a completely different picture. <laughs> I, I had no idea that rock bands did that. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. that's, that's big out here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Battle of the Bands was big, and they would get the sound system and the whole thing. And these bands was nice. Like oh. some of them went on to do some some cool stuff. Yeah. Oh, so I, being in in that environment, going through that, so it's a similar question, but not the same. A lot of artists always are thinking about brand, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of had those early cues that led towards a sense of brand. Mm -hmm. What did you think about your brand early on and how has that changed over the years? Because now you're doing a lot of stuff. Mm. And, our, you know, how do you contain that in one specific message? Oh, that's a great question. I don't, I didn't think of a brand, of branding anything back then, mm -hmm. right? Like you don't, you don't really, you're just creating, right? Because I think there's, there's like two types of, uh, entrepreneurs there's the artists who have to become entrepreneurs and then mm -hmm. there's like the entrepreneurs that are have the product and they need to go find artists to help them do the marketing you know mm -hmm. i was always yeah. just the artist and the creative and so i j i didn't really think about any of that stuff that, that was like a decade later when mm -hmm. it was like it was the logo yeah. <laughs> it was the color scheme you yeah. know it was a it was a you know we gonna build a plane as we fly it yeah you know type <laughs> And, and it. yeah, and it, <laughs> it, it, thankfully it worked out. Now, had I had someone tell me this stuff twenty years ago, I, I wonder how I would have. I don't know if I would have listened to be honest, you know. But I mm. feel like that stuff was so fragmented twenty years ago. Where like, I, to me, the first guy that kind of bridged it all together was Gary V. Like about ten years ago when he blew up. I feel like you start thinking about grant branding and marketing from a creative standpoint, mm. and then it kind of all glued together. But back then, I didn't really think about any of that stuff. I never wish I had, you know. I also wish I would have thought about financial literacy and <laughs> other things. You yeah. Know? yeah, but you brought up a good point though. Like, it's like, like you might not have listened, and we we right. run into that issue with our audience sometimes, where it's like, hey, this information yep. isn't gonna work the same for you because you haven't went through enough for, to put you in the mindset to where you can actually use it. And I yeah. think that's it's, it's undervalued because most yes. people start like that, right? Like we all have gotten advice before yeah. that, like we couldn't yeah. use even if we, we we know it's the best advice for us because of what we yeah. were mentally. You know what yeah, I'm I feel like when you're younger, you you, you have a lot of false dichotomies. Yeah. So it's like art and commerce can't coexist. Right. And it's like says yeah. who? Speak on that. Exactly. You know, says who? Why can't why can't why can't I feed my family and 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 make some money and drive a nice car and live in a safe neighborhood? And make art. Like, who says it don't? It, yeah. it can't coexist. Like, that's a very... So there's so many false dichotomies that I think I had mm. when I first started just going into this thing. And I... As I grew up, and I was like, oh, like, when I got hip to financial literacy, then I was like... There was a proverb in in this, in, in the Bible. It, was two, it actually repeats, and it says, those who chase fantasies will have their fill of poverty, 
but those who work their land will have abundance. Mm. Right? So those who chase fantasies will will be broke. <laughs> but those who work their land will have abundance. Will will will, will prosper. And so oh. I had to I got hit with the reality of like is this a fantasy? Like am I just chasing the wind doing what everybody else wants to be or is this actually my land? Mm. And my land is going to produce sustenance for me, and produce a harvest for me, and produce prosperity for me. And once I once I got that, I rem- I got it listening oddly enough to the Dave Ramsey show. We were getting out of debt, and I was listening to the Dave Ramsey show. So it's a little about thirteen years ago now. Okay. And and I and I was like, okay, I got I got to figure this out. And so the next year, we did a song a week, and then we did three mixtapes, two retail projects, and then going into twenty twenty. We did like 30, 40 college shows and like a couple of events with Lecrae. And that was like, boom, now this is a, a real part time thing. Mm-hmm. Not like, oh, we doing six figures, but like, okay, I, I think I took home like, I wanna say like 30 bands, mm-hmm. 2012 off of music. I was like, yo, Crazy. This, this, this could be something. Like, hey, I'm making so, more money off, my, off, off this than I am off my job. This could be something. Yeah. So, what clicked though? Because you didn't just say, all right, I need to make some money. You actually went and made money, and yeah. you didn't say, "Oh, I signed a deal," or "I went and got a loan," or anything like that. You literally just said, "I did more music. I dropped more music. Yeah. I did more shows." So, did you have these things pretty much available to you all the time, and you just weren't pulling on them? Like, what what, what was missing? I think a, a culmination. One, I think mindset. Like, I think you don't know what's possible until you're backed into a corner, and you're like, "All right, I got to figure this out." So. What what so what so okay so I I was we were doing the spoken word slam thing in San Diego like I was on a slam team and I heard about this thing called NACA I think I told you about NACA yeah, yeah, yeah. National Association for Campus Activities they put oh, on yeah. these regional okay. conferences yeah. so I knew that like oh they're like poets is getting booked to go perform at colleges and you ain't got to sell no tickets right yeah. <laughs> you ain't got to get deal yeah, with no yeah, promoters yeah. you just yeah. getting so so I always knew that in the back of my head and then I always knew that I can make a lot of music. And then this is around the time Kanye did Good Friday when he was releasing a song a week. Mm. And so I was like, oh, okay, there's something here to this frequency thing, it gets people excited. And Mm. so we did Remix Wednesdays and it was, hey, whatever your favorite song is, send us, tell us what your song is and we'll do our version of it, we'll remix it, you know? And then we took those and packaged them in a mixtape. We threw a, you know, DJ on, he blended them together. He do it intro outro. So it was a it was a culmination of things. It was a culmination of things. But the but the foundation of it was really hearing that verse and then sitting down my wife at the end of 2010. My birthday's on New Year's Eve, so it's the last day of the year. And I sat my wife down and I said, Hey, I can't be in the same place with music next year than I am this year. I need you to tell me to stop. Like if I, in a year from now, like if I'm in a I need you to tell me to stop. And that's the Man. year. 2011 was the year where we just we just did everything we could. We just threw everything we had at it, and going. And then we did that NACA conference that same year. Mm. So we knew we weren't going to get booked to churches. Like we just we we did, we didn't make the cookie cutter like church music, okay. Christian rap music. You know, it's Christian raps evolved a lot, but back then it was like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Which I got no problem with people when I want to make Jesus, Jesus movie music. And then it's like lifestyle music, kind of like what Lecrae does now, mm. right? And so we were doing that back then. So we're like, yo, we're not going to book these church shows. They're not bringing us out to play in front of the junior high kids in Kentucky. Like, it's just not happening. (laughs) But we can get these colleges because we can work in the spoken word. So we did the NACA conference, and this is like a November 2011. And so we, me and my wife have that conversation, New Year's Eve 2011. So And then we're going in. It's like 30 shows booked. You know, each show is like $2,500 a pop. You know, a couple events with Lecrae, and we're like, and she's like, yeah, this is amazing. Like everything you said you were gonna do, you did. Mm-hmm. Keep, let's keep going. You know, and the only reason I didn't quit my job back then is because we couldn't get healthcare. Like healthcare would have been like a like a thousand bucks a month, yeah. and then like a couple years later, the past um, covered California Obamacare, which okay, yeah. I feel like people sleep how much that helped entrepreneurs. You know, because mm-hmm. to just be able to go out and no, buy healthcare a, a on yeah. a, on a free market. And so 2015 is when I quit my job. Like a couple years after that, yeah. How did that feel? Scary, horrifying horrifying you know as an independent christian rapper yeah. in 2015 yeah horrifying you know it was terrible it was it was uh it was scary man and and i already like i saw youtube but then i kind of pivoted to like running a boutique label mm-hmm. for my for my friends and i was like all right well i i got this figured out let me just put some dudes on that are more talented than me 
And then we'll see how far this can go. But then in the process of that, I suppressed my own YouTube things, which then created resentment. And then it just, it all hit the fan, you know, years later. Now, you actually said something before I get into that. But what, how did it feel specifically to say, I'm going to do this, mm -hmm. babe, if I'm in the same place next year, tell me to stop, mm -hmm. which is a, you're putting yourself against the wall, your mm -hmm. dream against the wall. Mm -hmm. She didn't do that, which is, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. But then to actually go out and execute on your word, mm -hmm. right, and achieve something, just as an artist who was building as their own, what mm -hmm. did it feel to accomplish that specific thing? It was cool. Like, oh, man, we did it. Like, we're doing, we're making money now. Like, I watched the, I watched the Curtis King video, and he was talking about how uh, touring is a, is a money pit. People tour and they lose money. And mm -hmm. I never lost money on a tour. We was out here doing shows, did, did our first tour, 2014 did another one 2015 we was coming back with seven eight racks each like, okay just hold us down for a month or two you know finesse some features mm -hmm. boom go back out there in another mm -hmm. six months right so i it was it felt good but it wasn't it it was like we were taking home a little bit more than i was making at my job so it wasn't like comfortable All right and then the strain from being away from the family it felt good to be like yes I, we said we were going to do this. We did this. We defied all the odds. There wasn't really anyone else doing it. You know, I think Chance the Rapper and Macklemore were the only like indie sensations back then that I know, and Murs and like Tech Nine. But there wasn't really a lot of people getting it on like a lower middle class roots level with with music. Like it just didn't seem like that was a possibility. It was either like you were rich, signed to a label, or you were like a struggle rapper. Yeah. And so to carve out this little lower lower middle class, where you know, I, I, okay, I, I know I got to make three grand a month to cover all my bills. All right, I could do that, you know? And we just figured it out. So it felt good, but it was also horrifying. I get it, I get it, it's the journey. Let's take a quick second to talk about the elephant in the room. If you're an artist trying to grow, we already know what your goal is, a thousand true fans. Everybody talks about it, but how do you actually make that happen? How do you get those fans? It's not just about getting views. You gotta push people further down the funnel. So let's talk about it. Number one, do you have these people's data, right? Do you? have the ability to text and build highly engaging relationships with these people, can you boost your Spotify plays to actually have engaged users, not those surface level playlisting plays? Well, guess what? Fever Fan is a platform that allows you to do all of those things in one. So it's not overwhelming. You don't have to switch and have all these different logins and switch all your LinkedIn bios. You have even a LinkedIn bio tool that you can do. So everything is done in one place. So not only do you grow your fans, you do it for less work. How about that? Check out foreverfanmusic.com because we know it's not about views for the day. It's about getting fans who will be there forever. Foreverfanmusic.com. Let's get back to this video. So you said something that I've heard you say before. You just said you signed a couple of guys or you know worked with a couple of guys that were mm -hmm. more talented than mm -hmm. you. And I heard you in a different conversation. I don't even know if we were talking or not but you mentioned that you weren't the most talented, mm -hmm. right? I'd never hear artists say something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so curious, and that's the only reason I remembered you saying it. It was like, man, he's an artist. I've never heard anything like that. What brings that level of awareness, and how did that impact how you move building what you've built so far as an artist? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a white dude in hip-hop, so mm -hmm. first and foremost, you, I can know that like this ain't <laughs> my art. Like, this isn't, you know yeah. what I mean? So I think one for that, and so then when you go, okay, what is the edge that someone else would have, right? Because I think talent is just a culmination of skills that yeah. compound over time that appear magical. The talent's not, I don't mm -hmm. think anybody's born with an ability to rap better. Okay, I think people might be born with predispositions to rhythm and little things like that. But I think like talent is a lot of times like the, the artist, one of the artists I signed grew up in church singing gospel songs and then got to rap when he was really young in church so guess what if if you start that at three four five my son is playing piano at that eight he's nice like he could play chords right you start that in a child and that just compounds those are yeah. transferable skills so if you could hear the melodies in a gospel song and you could pick out the four-part harmonies and where you're supposed to fit in at 10 11 that's going to transfer directly over if you're trying to sing your own hooks if you could catch the cadences in the in the drums and catch the pattern of the bounce of the beats or, hey, well, this is going to be staccato, this is going to be, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All that is transferable. So I feel like if you're coming from a a, a black church background, you're in, you should be at an advantage musically mm -hmm. if you were in the choir, if you play drums, right? Yeah. And I didn't do none of that. Like, I'm Armenian. 
You know what I mean? Like we don't we our music is hymns. They, it sounds super gothic, you know. And like <laughs> we like track suits and baklava. Like that's the time we're on. You know what I mean? Like we we ain't out here with the with the ill rhythms and the cadences, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so it just it just it transfer. I just you could just hear it. You know, you could you could just hear the the I could hear the difference of like okay the tone, how much more natural the voice sounds, the melodies, the rhythm, the pockets. And I'm like I would be fooling myself to thinking that like. I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not delusional. And, or what, do I go the nerd rap? You know, scam, scamming with the man hamming, like the, the Eminem route? Like, that's <laughs> mad corny too. You know, I don't diss the M, like M's a legend, but like, so what am I going to, like, if I'm trying to make art, like actual art that speaks with, not, 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 not art from the culture, but art for the culture. Because there's a lot of folks that come from hip hop and then like, kind of like extract it and say, okay, now we're going to go make music for, the conservative crowd, yeah. like no, no diss to any of those guys. They're, 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 that's not the same as like we're making music from and for the culture, yeah. you know. And I just knew that I wasn't the guy for that. Like I wasn't the guy for that job, you know. Now I, and that doesn't mean I, I shouldn't make music. I love making music, but I just knew there was a you difference. You still make music. Yeah, I still make music. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. Black church is like music boot camp. Oh my it's gosh, crazy. man. It's pretty <laughs> crazy. My gosh, I wish I would. I, there was a so my faith journey is interesting because there was a a, a, a lady in my apartment complex name was Sheree. And I was the, with those two Armenian refugee families and all the rest of the complex was black, was black families. And she was moving weight and she got caught, went to jail, got saved in jail, came out a year or so later and the whole apartment complex got converted. Like everyone was Christian, right? Oh, except, she, except, she tough. except the Armenians. Okay. Right. And I was like, man, had I just like not fought God back then, I could have went and got into the <laughs> yeah. black church that they was going to and got, you know what I mean? Got some of the sauce and maybe I would be a better rapper now. That was like That's 10, funny. 11 years old. And I just fought, 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 fought. And then I didn't get saved till like five years after that. But she was the one that planted those. See, so my, my background is hearing Fred, hearing Kirk, hearing, you know what I mean? Hearing the music, yeah. but I wasn't, I, I didn't get it back then. And now it's gotcha. like in hindsight, I'm like, man, what a, what an amazing journey of, overcoming all the odds that the black churches had, had gone through in America, you know? And those are the folks that like really share the gospel with me first, mm. you know? Okay, that makes sense now. That makes a lot of sense. So understanding, or you seeing at least, as people are more talented to me, this isn't my specific path. I do love to make music and you have legitimate fans, by the way, right? Yeah. So that's, so that's important to note, but then start to carve out this different path where now you, you know, YouTuber, for mm -hmm. lack of better words. Um, you have your community on Discord. Um, what do you call, you know, being a voice in the faith community, right, on the Christian community that goes, like you're doing what many of them actually don't do as well as far as the platforms you'll go on, mm -hmm. speaking um, your truth. Well, it wouldn't be your truth, but the, the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so now you're do you're going that path, but you still seem to. It doesn't feel like, hey, I just left music, mm -hmm. right? I think you've done a good job at combining it all, yeah. where it just feels like this is Ruslan, and I have this unique brand. And the value of that to me is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pursuing that same dream that every artist has followed, because mm -hmm. many in artists are looking at the label. And then they say, no, I don't want to be a label artist. I mm -hmm. want to be indie. Mm -hmm. Yet they're following the exact same dream with a handicap, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You went away from that specific dream. You're still plant making music, mm -hmm. seem to be happy and independent as a music and building your own, a world of your own. So how does that inform like the way you look at talent, your talent and how you're using your talents now? How is that journey formed? Yeah, I think so. The the YouTube thing just came organically. I remember you was on my channel years ago, right? Like, two, like three years. Yeah, I was traveling yeah. around and and doing stuff. I think you came to the studio, the last studio, mm -hmm. but we also got together when I was for. When you were in Atlanta in A three C. Did we do a pod that day or did we not? Me and Wendy. Wendy Day. Back to that's back. right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So I was already doing the YouTube of just like, oh, I'm just like Rayman Shaw. He's interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's interview him, Wendy Day. Like she. So I was already doing that back then. The the transition was was everything locked down. I can't do shows. Mm. No one's hitting me up for features, you know. And like I 
shoot, I can't interview nobody, so let me just do this virtual thing. And it just kind of popped off from almost like a reaction, conversational, interviewing people virtually, and it kind of popped off. And so the YouTube is, it's an interesting thing. This is my view. If I can, if I can add value, and I know that sounds generic, right? But if I can simplify things for people, if I can impart wisdom to people that I've learned over my 20 years and help people, then the the byproduct of that will be well they'll they'll support me in some way shape or form they'll they'll it's recidivism right they want uh, reciprocity yeah. they'll they want to do something back just and then that naturally that's how we are mm. so having that like we built out the patreon to over two thousand monthly patreon now right we have um the merchandise i still put out, i just put out a song like two or three weeks ago you know um we still put out music all of these things it, i just needed a wider net like I needed more people because Christian hip hop is still mad small. Like even though Lecrae is big and there's a couple of people that it's still a very small micro tribe. So I just needed a wider net of people. And then I'm like, eventually I could, I could kind of all transfer it over. You know, I, I could get the YouTube people to check for the music and I could get the music people to come over to YouTube. And that's who it was initially. And so I just needed a wider net. And I didn't really want to do the TikTok thing like that. You know, like I wasn't good at dancing. That was initially what TikTok was. But mm -hmm. I saw that and I'm like, all right, well, we'll go over here on YouTube. I think I could talk and, and simplify things that come off complicated that, are, that I don't think are complicated. And it just kind of compounded, you know, over time. And so the music is, it's like, be, it's like, <sighs> Not to sound arrogant, but it's like legitimately having your own label, like being your own label, but like having the funds to get the feature that you want or pay for the mixing engineer that you want or get the beat that you want and it not be no sweat off your back. Like that's what it feels like now. And so it just depends on how much I want to put out, you know, and, and how, so the, what I'm doing now, I'm writing a book and I'm going to put the album, I'm going to put the album inside of the book as a QR code while I put out the singles on DSPs. Mm. So that way the people that really, really want an album, they can get an album. And then I could just keep putting a song out every three weeks, every every month, and and just kind of building up my Spotify followers. I'm at like 30,000 followers on Spotify, which is my smallest platform. You know, so if I could keep building that up, get that to 100,000, 200,000, then the algorithm in there can kind of service it. You know, mm -hmm. and that's what YouTube's doing. YouTube, so Instagram does the work for me. I just got to make the content. Yeah. If I can get Spotify to do that for me, I just got to put the music on there and then it'll, you know. And so, like, you know, my, my buddy Nick, like, it's the same thing. Like, he got, I think his Spotify is over 200,000 followers, 250,000. He just, he just knows if I drop a song, day one is going to do 60,000. Day two is going to do a hundred. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and it just becomes its own algorithm. So that's how I'm looking at it now. I'm looking at like long term play. How could I build the followers up? How could I build the engagement up? And then it's just you're just you're clicking into the ecosystem. Mm. So, I love the fact that you talked about expanding basically your music base through yeah. something else instead yeah. of just how I left it. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that actually work? Like you, you said that, but yep. then are you seeing the transferability from crowd to crowd? Um, the define work like money wise. We know this is working money wise to some extent versus yeah. music, right? I'm yeah. just saying, like, are you seeing people truly go from, hey, I like watching his videos where he's preaching some the word, yeah. and now I'm listening to his music. Hey, I'm listening to his music, and now I'm yeah. watching him preach preach the word, and I just bought some merch. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. It's it's um. It's always a pleasant surprise when people find out, and then it be then the then, so it's then like helping helping people find out. So we ran we'll, we'll run an ad, like we'll we'll have our own uh, brand deal with the music inside mm -hmm. of the videos. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so yeah. it's like, yo, yeah, you may not know I make music. I got a new song coming out. Pre save it for me. Da da da. And then yeah, so I have songs now that like have came out in the last six months that have outperformed any record I've ever put out in the last six years, mm. you know, on Spotify, just because we, we push it. The, the, the issue for us becomes the discipline and the focus to push it. Like having the margin to go and shoot the commercial to tell people to pre-save and drop that into a video every day for six weeks out and then making sure we keep promoting it on the back end. And when you're built, when you're doing a media company, that's that's difficult because I'm like, oh man, Brand, Brand Man Sean's coming over. Like, I forgot to shoot the, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. it's a lot of moving pieces. But yes, in terms of the actual streams on the last three songs I've put out have outperformed the last 30 songs I've put out. 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like big, big, like big, 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 big numbers. You know, um, for me, not big numbers in general, but for me. And so, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we just get better at the process. You know, but it's not the so. But, but, but the flip side is like when that's not the the money isn't the necessary for music, then it becomes you're driven different. You know, it could actually be art. Like I could actually make what I want instead of like, let me just try to get a flip. Let me just do this pre-order to get these albums sold, right? Like I could actually make what I want and take my time with it. So it just becomes the best of both worlds. But the the issue becomes now focus. Like let me find time to focus on marketing it. Musically, do you like it better that way? Or artistically, the fact that I don't have to create something just to make money, I can create music. Yeah, I I think artistically it's better. I think I w- there's not as much push, you know. I'm not like, I'm not like making sure my babies are fed. <laughs> you know, so there's there's not the same external motivation, but artistically, it's more fun that way for sure. It's just le- it's less pressure. So I can just make what I want. You know, I can make what I want and and let it be fun. And if it hits, it hits. If it doesn't, I got another one. Yeah, and it can. It's interesting because I think when a lot of artists say that they want to be like rich or famous, what they really mean is, hey, I would like to be able to create art without the pressures of my life falling apart. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? If I, if I don't figure it out, which I personally feel like is a, a much more doable goal for majority of artists, right? Like, like you said earlier, hey, I made 30K and I was happy with that. I wasn't rich, but it could cover my bills. And like that to me mm-hmm. is like a very important first step for artists, right? Like just see if you can even just cover basic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Off of your music and then start trying to be Drake or whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause, Cause here's the flip side. Like you may not want to be Drake. Yeah. That sounds cool until you, you get you, there. You get there. Yeah. Or 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 you get in this weird in between spot where like if I'm go like I, I go out now and I'm recognized at least once a day. And I'm not trying to like you know what I mean? But there'll be times where like my niece fell and scraped her her shin and she's crying and I'm trying to console her and someone's trying to come up and like mm-hmm. take a picture. You know, <laughs> and I'm just like read the room. Like yeah. this ain't you just yeah. you know what I mean? And 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 it's such a f- silly first world problem, but I'm like I couldn't imagine not being able to move through without security or yeah. without, you know what I mean? Like I couldn't imagine that. So like people may not know that they may not even really want that. What you really want is the financial freedom to live where you want, eat what you want, wear what you want, drive the car that you want. And that's really it. That's really all you want. You yeah. don't want all the other stuff that comes with it, you know, because the other stuff can, that, that could weigh you down. And I don't think, by the way, I don't think Drake, Drake is that happy. Like I think at the end of the day, Drake's probably not as happy as we think he is. Doesn't seem to be. Yeah, I can agree with that. <laughs> I, I somebody make a point of me once that they were like, "Man, you you ever think about why all these big artists get like these mega mansions?" And I'm like, "No, nah, I never thought about it." And he's like, "Because they can't move around the same in the real world, so you don't mm. really have space. So to use space is walking from room A in my mansion to room Z in my mansion because that's the most wow. space you're going to get." And I, when they told me, that, I was like, "Damn, that's a good point. You know, like, this is a great point. You know, um, man, wow. how, many, how many artists get the come back down the pipeline and tell you like, yo, this is what it's really like to be a Drake, a Travis yeah. Scott or yeah. a, a Beyonce or something, right? They don't, they're not going to talk about that publicly. Yeah. But like you said, sometimes I feel like, I, I can see it in Drake's eyes sometimes, man. He be looking, he be looking burnt out, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've just been around, I've been around, I've never been around Drake, but I've, I've been around a handful of people and they, I, I, they, they didn't seem happy. Mm-hmm. They didn't seem happy. Like they didn't really seem, they seem pumped on what money can do for them but not like content and like relax. I'm like, yeah, I don't really know if that's everything. And then my friends that became more successful all of a sudden had all these mental illness issues. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you was fine when you was broke. Now you talking about depression, this and anxiety, that. No, I'm like, what? What is going on? You Where know? do you think that comes from? Man, I think sometimes when you can remove your basic needs of food, shelter, clothing, you then can do one of two things. You can then discover other traumas that you were suppressing because you were just trying to get it. Mm. And now you have the time and the headspace to deal with it because you're not thinking about survival. Yeah. You know, and, and or it could be you just creating first world problems for yourself. You know, you're just in your head too much. And yeah. and, I, and I don't know, we all got some some degrees of trauma, but I've seen friends like really like, whoa, like you seem way happier before you were paid, you know? And I'm like, I'm glad you got a therapist and you're doing a deep work, but like, all of our parents would love to wake up and be us right now. <laughs> like mm. my parents would love to wake up and be me. You know what I mean? Like and have my life now. Like what are we? What are we upset about? And it's like you know. But sometimes it'd be legitimate trauma. Like sometimes it'd be like, yo, this happened and I didn't. I, I suppressed this and then this came and I. You know what I mean? Now I got to work. But I see a lot of folks doing. You know that they get paid and all of a sudden they're thinking about these things. Mm. Mm. You can afford to 
for it to find out what's wrong with you. Yeah. 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 That I I definitely agree with that to an extent where you when you solve all these other problems, now you have these other problems to face. Yep. Or when you can't blame other people or you can't you aren't focused on paying the next bill and the, now yeah. you're left with yourself and there's a lot of people who aren't cool with themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the music thing is like like media is not that complicated. You know what I mean? Like like there's there's certain predispositions we have to be good at something or not be good at something. For mm -hmm. me, I think I was on the I think I was I was on the right bus in the wrong seat. Like I knew I should have been doing media, but I was trying to be in the artist rapper seat mm -hmm. where I was really in a media thought leader seat, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I could kind of go and go back. Well, I think once you figure out, you, first of all, are you on the right bus? Should you be doing media or should you be doing like social work? You know what I mean? Like should you be doing activism work, <laughs> right? One, are you on the right bus? Two, are you on the right bus and on the right seat? Because I thought that like I'm supposed to be the rapper and I'm like, I'm not really supposed to be the rapper. I could be a guy that does rap, but I'm I'm the podcast host. I'm the lead. I'm the thought leader. I'm, I'm, I'm these other things that does music. So once I figured out, all right, let me get on the right bus on the right seat. Yep. Then it just became easier because then it's like, OK, now let's just reverse engineer what's missing in a specific marketplace. Do I have the values, the the skills to add to this ecosystem? And if I do, then let me just do it over a long enough time horizon until it's impossible for me not to be successful. You know what I mean? And that's how that's how I look at everything. You know, now we're, you know, we're building our products out, doing a book. It's it's all the it's all the same thing. So I think to your point, we we have this false dichotomy of like art and commerce and all that. And it's like mm -hmm. it's not that complicated. It really isn't. At the end of the day, we are trying to entertain people. You're competing against Netflix. Yeah. You're competing you're competing against Drake. You know, why would they, why should they give you their attention over someone else's attention? Is your music that remarkable? Is your story that good? Or can you emotionally connect? And am I I just if I'm being honest, I'm just like, oh, I'm not I'm not I'm not on the emo boy stuff, you know? And I'm not that technical of a rapper. So mm. let me go build a tribe outside of the music and then bring them over to the music. And this also allows me to then do the sync deals and like where all the real money is at mm -hmm. is in the publishing and in the sinks and no one's talking about that right it's like that's where the real like independent money is at. as you could be making you know we were doing six figures off of music bed and i was like yo why you know no one else is talking about it. everyone's trying to make it as the rapper and it's like there's real money out here to get your song on like we got a song on uh the video game team that drake owns and it was like a five thousand dollar bag you know, uh, Will Smith reacted, like did a thing with our song in the background, Google, Adidas. That's where, the, you know, low key, that's where a lot of the real money is. If you mm -hmm. own the publishing and you own the music and the composition, you're making your own beats. Especially with more content being created than ever. Yes. Beats increased. Yeah. Micro that's what they call it. Micro syncs. Right? Micro, -syncs, Mi -syncs, micro -syncs, yeah. yeah. What did you call that site? You said Music Bed. Music Bed. Yeah. Music Bed is basically, they're just a website that oversees all that they're like uh epidemic sounds you know like they like these like what well, well, music bed is like we're the cream of the crop like we're the nicest for how selective we are and how bougie we are with our taste and so i just built a relationship with them 10 years ago and have consistently had our stuff on there mm. and so it's like you know a bad month is like 1500 you know a good month is like five so oh. you know <laughs> and that's 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 truly passive mm. That's true. And that's the part that I'm most excited about music is music can be truly passive once you get into the publishing syncing side, meaning I can make a record and then someone else can go service it for me and get it synced. And that's powerful. I still got to make up and do wake up and do YouTube videos. I still got to I, got, I still got to figure out the, the next merch drop. Right. Like that's I'm, I'm trading time for money right now. But if you can really tap into saying, let me make music that's being synced by major corporations and I'm just collecting, I just get a little PayPal deposit every month. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. So music bed, there's other ones, but music bed is who I'm with. And I, I've always loved music bed, you know, and they, and they take their cut. It's a 50, 50 split, you know, so they, they're, and they're worth every penny, you know, 1500 a month passive. I know young Sean. Hey, yeah. <laughs> I was making then, that was a great check. 1500 a month passive. I know obviously your responsibilities exceed that at the moment, but it's great to, to see that you could do something and it be truly passive. Yeah. And I think that's the the difference, right? We, we get sold all these ideas of passive and they even try to act like YouTube. It could mm -hmm. be passive. Yeah, YouTube's not, not passive. It's, it's not. You got to get up and do the pod. <laughs> you got to get not. up and make the videos and make the thumbnail and make the, you know what yeah. I mean? The title. That's not passive, but yeah. yeah. I mean, and I guess and I guess that's, is it, it is passive in the sense that I make the song once and it can keep getting exploited mm -hmm. and marketed, Yeah, which is dope. You know, you said something that made me think about Oprah Winfrey because she started off as 
like a news correspondent, mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. like that, right? Got fired because she really, in her mind, overcared about some of the people she was supposed to be reporting on, mm-hmm. would like try to go back and help people instead of just reporting the 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 story. Ends up getting fired, mm-hmm. and then obviously finds that position as a talk show host, which wasn't a coveted position in when she was put in it, that mm-hmm. particular position, but it was her space, mm-hmm. right? That's what I thought about when you talked about being on the right bus, but in the wrong seat, mm-hmm. right? What do you think is keeping many artists from your conversations, from having that real conversation with themselves? Like what is What are my talents? And is there a a way or a space that I could fit and do even better with these talents than just music. I think, uh, I think ego is an interesting thing, right? Cause ego isn't the same as necessarily confidence. I feel like ego is like an overinflation mm. of confidence. So if you're truly solid, you understand that confidence comes as a byproduct of competence. I've done X, Y, and Z. Yes. I'm competent and therefore I'm com- my, my wife is confident that, that I can lead our home. Right? Why? Because I've repeatedly shown that I can lead our home, so she trusts me. Mm-hmm. But I think ego is that like overcompensation of something you're not really sure about. And so you're just trying to puff your chest out and act like you could do something that you can't do. Right? It's like power lifting in the gym. It's like, it's like you know, like you're overdoing it. Yeah. You know, ego lifting, right? Like yeah. you don't, you can't really handle that weight, but because there's this guy here or the girl here you think you can and i think i think it's that i think it's it's ego lifting like mm. you're taking on more than you can handle and you don't really know your own strength ability and what you're actually capable of and so you're ego lifting your form is sloppy and you're putting yourself at risk of injury and i think it's the same exact thing with artists trying to do things that they're not competent in is your your ego lifting and uh you might be get away with it a couple times and you might look cool and you might be like yeah I hit the 225 I hit it I hit it eight times you really hit it two times and the rest of the time you were sloppy you know you didn't really yeah. but <laughs> you can do that a little bit but eventually you're going to hurt yourself eventually you're going to hurt yourself eventually you going or you're going to get with a trainer and they're going to be like your form is terrible so I think it's the same exact thing I think it's like yo people overcompensate because they're insecure and so trying to be an artist when you're not is harmful it's you're hurting yourself you know it's not helpful and if you if you don't got it now you can go and get it you can go and spend two three years and refine it and go hire a rap coach there's those exist now by the way not sure if you guys know yeah yeah yeah. you can get hire a rap coach you can work on it you can go take singing lessons you can learn to produce you could do all of it the question is is the opportunity cost too much meaning that that three years you spent trying to get better (laughs) could you have spent that doing something else you know and I think that's that 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 that's where it comes from, you know. And so I think anyone could get to a place where they're making good music, but then it's all the other intangibles. What about your look? What about the aesthetic? What about your relationships? What about who you are in in the studio? Are you fun to be around? Right? All these. Are you good at social media? You could do all those things and just be terrible at at TikTok, mm-hmm. you know. Or you could be great at TikTok and be mediocre at all those things. So it's like all of these different things you got away, and there's only so many hours and so many years. And you know, most of the music now is youth music. So you gonna get it to pop by 25 or what? Now there's certain folks that are just phenomenal. They're just great, right bus, right seat, crushing it. You know, like you, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that kid Jake on um, yeah yeah TikTok. On, on TikTok. So I'm yeah. friends with his brother Zach. Super cool kids, uh, Christian kids, like the whole bit, and like he's just a phenom on the piano. But he's also great at social media, mm-hmm. you know? And so some kids just, they, 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 that's a skill set. Those are two different skill sets you got to learn, right? So I, I just go, man, I don't, I don't know if I got the skill set to try to like learn to sing with auto-tune, but it sound just natural enough, mm-hmm. you know? Like, I don't know if I got the capacity to do that right now, you know? And so I think that's where it comes from. It's just people are uh overcompensating and we can get super deep on like why do you even want to be famous or do mm-hmm. you want to be famous yeah. what are we even what are we even aspiring for yeah. at the end of the day right i think i think it could go so deep but i think most people just aren't truly self-aware enough you know of where they're at you know because if you're really good you could get a, a laptop a computer a microphone boom now you now you're now you're making your own music and then you 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 just get on the phone and figure out how to hack tiktok and instagram mm-hmm. and and you could be an overnight star you know, but then that's a whole nother dilemma. Can you handle that? You know, can you handle that? So I think most people are just, they're just, they don't want to be self-aware and they're overcompensating for something. 
Yeah, I, I feel like it's, 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 a, it's a very hard, I guess, truth to come to terms with as an artist. But then the flip side of it, I always think about is how much better would the music industry be if a lot of artists realize that, right? Like how many better mm. managers would we have or marketers or publicists or, cause I've met artists before who, like you said, maybe the the music quality is not the part, but they're great at marketing. They think like a, a great marketing. It's like, man, like you could kill it like mm -hmm. helping other artists, you know what I'm saying? Do what you are attempting to do. So I always think about it, I mean, like how, how much of the music industry is being held back because the majority of the people that want to be in it want to be the artists, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Instead of figuring out how can I go help these people who may be more talented than me or can do social media better than me or, or like all those things you said pretty much. Like I think it's a it's an epidemic, man. Yeah. It's a true epidemic. Yeah. I think a lot of these kids are growing up knowing TikTok, which is going to be an advantage too. Yeah. It's just like growing, if you grew up singing in the black church, you know, now you grow up with the, with the phone in your hand, now you know mm -hmm. TikTok. You yeah. Know? You kind of just finesse your way to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of natural advantages that come with the platforms today because they're not even trying and you're on... We saw that when TikTok started popping, a lot of those first stars, they became stars not by trying. Mm -hmm. They were just kids having fun. Mm -hmm. And that was a weird moment in time because you have kids who have this amazing fame that weren't seeking to be fame, mm -hmm. famous. I wasn't looking to be a big artist. I just made my first song because it sounded cool and I was mm -hmm. just doing it because it was fun. Or now I'm Charlie D'Amelio because I was doing these dances mm -hmm. and it, it happened so quickly and then because of that, you saw a lot of struggle of kids. I started to see pushback because we work with a lot of influencers. You mm -hmm. can see kind of like the change and um, like they had to kind of pull back for their mental health, right? They'll mm -hmm. just tap out. You're like, man, you have all these followers. You're going to get this money just for posting. You're going to post to a song anyway. And then you realize, you know, some of these kids are burned out. It's like, I didn't even want this. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was fun for a second, but I didn't want this. And you saw that entire story, that arc in a hyperbolic chamber, mm -hmm. right? And I think some artists or people in general, they don't find their success fast enough to have that same experience, but mm. the experience will be the mm. same. I, I stopped reading my YouTube comments. Really? And I'm and I'm and I'm a 30 year 38 year old father and I stopped reading my YouTube comments cuz wow. most of it is just not good. <laughs> <laughs> right? Cuz it's the person that has no outlet and this is their way to try to mm. you know. So I could imagine being 18 19 years old on oh, yeah. TikTok which Ooh. is like even darker than YouTube and how oh yeah. man, yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the other side we saw were a lot of people that were opportunist managers mm. and never managed anybody just signing oh, a bunch of influencers yeah. yeah just so they can then have leverage Jeez. to get a big deal with a company and take that cut with no individual plan for Ruslan mm. I, I don't even know what to do with Ruslan right, right, anyway right. but I also am not trying to individually push your career along yeah. I'm really saying yeah I'm going to give you some money but that's because I'm just saying I got Ruslan Jacory Sharon to yeah. all in one hey big corporation and I built my relationships and it was it was a weird and fortunate thing yeah. to see cuz I knew what was happening but the influencer space hasn't had the education and timeline that the artist face has, mm. right? Because it's newer. It's so much newer. Yeah. It's so much newer. So I think we're going to see a lot of interesting things yeah. bubble up yeah. in the next five years. Which, what, what, what percentage do you guys think of, of TikTok as it is now, Instagram reels, YouTube shorts? What percentage of music exploding right now do you think is still... Uh, synthetic meaning there's a label there's an agency behind it someone someone is behind it pumping money into something and which percentage of it do you guys think is still organic like if mm -hmm. an artist is starting today i'm 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 really curious on like what do y'all think is like 50 50 half this stuff is organic right, and, I, and organic is a, is a loaded term right yeah, but by, by organic i just mean there's not a corporation a label management behind it it's still kids in their bedroom making the music they want to make and right. it's taken off but and just to be even clearer so not my mom is helping me, yeah. not even me. Am I an artist and I'm pushing my own music? You're just mm -hmm. talking about pure, I'm a kid making stuff. I'm a kid making stuff with the hope to be seen. With the hope to be seen. With the hope to be seen. And, maybe, and maybe dad is like guiding you a little bit. Maybe mom's guiding you with a little no bit. No financial investment? No financial investment. Man, you got a laptop and a mic and, a, and an iPhone. That become, like actually make it or just doing it? You get a trending song on Spotify. I would say maybe like 10, 15 percent. 10, 10, 15 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Because to Sean's point, like there's a lot more artist education mm -hmm. out there, right? Like there's been 
you know, like Sean's been making content for like seven years. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people who've been making content for years. And so now what I'm seeing is that there are these kids who come into the space already having an idea of what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And they've at least sought out the resource. Like I get DMs from like, I'm sure you get DMs from like 15 year olds, 16 mm -hmm. year olds all the time. Are you like, man, how'd you even, how'd you even know you need ads mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. right? So I think the education of it, uh, education for artists makes that question a little hard to answer. Like, like I've talked to some 17 years that know, uh, like, hey, like, I'm stacking up two bands for these Facebook guys I want to run in mm -hmm. three months. And it's like, damn, like, you know, like, you, you're thinking about that. So I, I would say maybe like 10 to 15%. Would you agree? Yeah. 10, 15? Yeah, on a high end. Okay. Yeah. Now, how, now what about the solopreneur DIY or what percent, like the guys that are messaging you? And they're saving their money, and they actually have a low understanding of. Yeah, that's uh, probably like sixty, seventy. I think that's sixty, sixty. Of the folks getting on the trend. Oh, we're actually trending? making it. Okay, good point. Um, I, I'm just using Spotify yeah. trending as like a benchmark of success. If you get a record on Spotify trending, that's like not much. Yeah, I was like maybe I, I was gonna say twenty. People who are intentional with a level of education, mm -hmm. um, investing in themselves, mm -hmm. even because I would still outside of money, content is so powerful at this time. You don't even have to think about money. Like content done right will do even more, like mm -hmm. way more than the money will do mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. So like Nick D, right? You, the amount of money that would go into doing what he's done, yeah. like is ridiculous right. outside of investing in the, the, the you know, equipment. The, the equipment and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. But so I would say 30% of those people who are intentional in that space, money or, or not, right? That 10 to 15, the, 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 the place that it gets blurry, is these labels, these ARs, the tech, even TikTok itself, they're so early now. Mm. They're watching it. So even if the bubble happens, like the spark, I think if we just talk about pure spark mm. that's pure and organic, that could be as large as 60 to 70. Yeah, wow. That happens every day. Right? That but that's every day. 60 to 70. The yes. spark is organic. The spark. But that's, and then all of a sudden somebody comes along and then expands on yeah. it. Right. And so it happens so fast, it's hard yeah. to catch. That's still amazing, days. though. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, that's incredible. Great. 60 it's to 70 beautiful percent, space the to spark be is organic. That's, yeah. that's yeah. huge. Because now the the barrier to entry is a lot lot lower, right? right? So it's like, hey, if you work these things right, you can get in the game. And then when you stay in the game, is, is a different conversation, right? Because that, uh, what would make me say 20% instead of 30 is that I think a, another big component of it is time. Mm -hmm. Like, there have been a lot of artists where, you know, we even had in one of our TikTok reports where, we noticed that it took an artist on average like low end 10 months to like high end like 18 months to catch like their first mm. viral moment. Okay. Right. Or viral moment that the spark kind of like Sean said, right? To that point. And then you start thinking about like, okay, how many artists will keep making five TikToks a day for two years straight? Mm -hmm. Not a lot of them, you know what I'm saying? And that significantly lowers the, the percentage. It's mm -hmm. great for the other 20, 30% of the decides to stick it out, right? Because mm -hmm. the competition is falling off. But the time component of it, I think now more than ever, is the biggest differentiator between who makes it and who doesn't make it. Mm -hmm. Because like we all have access to the same knowledge. Everybody can go buy, buy the same courses. Everybody can watch the same YouTube videos. We all yeah. can create a Facebook ad account, right? We all can reach out to influence. We can we can all do it. So now like what's the difference between Sean, artist Sean and artist Corey? Sean might be willing to do it for three years straight where I only got six months of me, mm -hmm. you know? And then Sean, ends up getting the success two and a half years later and we as the audience sees it as overnight. But if you go back and look at like most artists who caught like a real viral moment on TikTok, like if you really scroll through their page, most of them have been posting for like two, three years straight. And then, wow. they, and then they catch one random moment and then everything kind of changes from there. So, wow. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's this interesting. This is the thing about that though, right? Because this is why it's so tough and music is so tough. You can go for those years, right? Have that viral moment, but then that's just when the game starts, yep. right? Always say you're driving to the race, right? Things happen. Now you're at the race mm -hmm. and it's time to run that race. So the game is, oh, so I'm posting, I'm posting, I'm posting, or I'm trying to create something and I bought myself a minute. Now, how can I turn that minute into a moment? Mm -hmm. Now, how can I turn that moment and make it last a month. Yeah. How do I turn that month into a year, that year into a career? That's good. And it's each stage of that is a completely different skill set where we've seen artists gain progress, but then not know what to do in those other periods. Mm -hmm. Like you talked about blowing up and can you take it? I've known artists. It sounds so crazy. Who, and Ja'Cory knows these people and have had these conversations. 
they'll take off on TikTok, go mm-hmm. crazy, right? And then they completely step back. Mm-hmm. Like literally, one, some of them out of just naivety, they don't understand that it's more. But there's been literally some people who say, man, I just stopped going in the app. The comments, it was crazy. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a lot. And literally, I just stopped going in the app. When I heard that one time, it just made me realize, wow. like you said, it's just those those yeah. levels. And are you willing to maintain and sustain that? You know, yeah. it's crazy. You, I think you said 18 months. Yeah, like 10, 18 months. You know what's, cra- what's crazy about that is they say it takes the average person 18 months to get out of debt. Really? Mm. Yeah. 18, like, like a focused, locked-in plan of 18 months. Almost anybody can get out of debt. Me and my wife paid off, it was about 50K, but it was really like 100K in 18 months. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. we settled for one big uh, one big thing that was oh, like 60. We settled it for like a stack. And so the rest of it, it was about 45 to 50K in 18 hey, months. While we're here on the subject, that's some value information. And a lot of artists <laughs> yeah. are having financial troubles. Yeah. What? Give me a quick overall... A summary of that strategy, right? Like, what is it? Yeah. I just work, 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 save, and then all of a sudden, I pay it all. Am I paying it off over time? Like, we, what's the we strategy? Did the, we did the snowball, the, the, Dave, the, Ramsey the, the Dave Ramsey okay. snowball. So okay. it would you start with your smallest debt, knock that out, and you go to your next smallest, and you knock that out. And so it's is it, that a psychology or is it's that a psychology because okay. you get the um the the gratification of like oh like we paid off the the five hundred dollar credit card now mm-hmm. we paid off the thousand dollar credit card now we paid off the five thousand dollar car now we paid off the ten thousand dollar student loan and we you know what I mean so we just we did that and yeah eight, 18 months you know we had knocked everything out and then that the, in in that process is how I started thinking more entrepreneurially because I was like okay this got to make sense on paper you know and I think w- when it comes to artists. The area that that most people then struggle with is after you get debt free, which a lot of people don't even get debt free, but after you get debt free is the lifestyle creep because that starts to impact you. You start wanting to eat at nicer restaurants. You start wanting to wear nicer clothes. You start Mm. wanting to have nicer cars, you know? And so like, even in my case, like I've been very, I could afford a Tesla right now. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm gonna wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait as long as I can, you know? So right, my wife, me and my wife got one car right now, you know what I mean? And it's just like, why? Not, I could afford it. I could afford the $1,500 car note. I'm just not going to get a car note. Mm-hmm. I'm going to wait until I can buy a cash or buy the majority of it cash or figure out what my accountant says in terms of like, oh, we could do the you know 6,000 car pound thing where if you got a car that's more than 6,000 yeah. pounds, it could become a, a, a business car. Yeah. How can I make content in the car? Mm-hmm. Can, I, can I record some songs in the car? And mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think that's how I'm thinking about with the lifestyle creep. I think once you get a little bit of money, it's the lifestyle creep. Before that, it's just let me clean it all up. But if you think about that, if, you, if the average person is walking around with debt and you just decrease your overhead, right? I I had I went from having to make it's called a five grand a month to when I got debt free I needed to make three grand a month to survive. And granted, this is this is ten years ago, mm-hmm. but that's a big jump. So if I had if I could decrease my my every monthly all my monthly if I could decrease it, then I can get closer to making that off of music. And if I could do it off of music, then I could buy myself more time to focus on other revenue building ventures related to music and that's all we did is like we just we decreased our expenses way down i think we would live between 2500 and 3000 a month and this is with a family in southern california you know what yeah. i mean so if you're in the middle of nowhere you could do it for way less but yeah. 2500 to 3k a month we knew we needed to do that and that's with health and wealth health insurance with giving to the church everything and so i was like i could do like i could do that i could make 25 i could make that work even if i got to go work for uber thankfully i never had to go work for uber i never had to do uber eats or anything like that i could make that work and so the decreasing of the overhead allows the flexibility in terms of the freedom of what you're going to do for work you know because now you don't got to do the corporate job that you hate you can go do, do the creative job half time and then do the music on the side you know mm-hmm. man i love everything you just said just the entrepreneurial thinking so, you know, at the beginning of the podcast, we always say the intersection of creativity and currency, mm-hmm. right? Because we want artists to understand that you can have that intersection mm-hmm. without it being a conflict, right? I believe that artists are the ones who get the short end of the stick when we try to make it seem like currency and business can't o- coexist. Mm-hmm. That's why business people with ill will have been able to take advantage of artists right. over the years. That's right. Because we think, oh, like, if I want to be this creative and this actually works against it, I should not even work 
actively to capture it, right? Mm-hmm. And there's been artists over the years who have tried to get the message out. You know, Prince and many others mm-hmm. have tried to make it very clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to be able to capture the currency that's related to your creativity. And it looks like that's exactly what you're doing, you know, through many ways, many avenues. One thing that you've also been able to do, you pick, you mentioned your Patreon, mm-hmm. right? You have a ton of followers. Uh, well, what is subscribers, Patreons, pa- Patreon, yeah. you know, a couple thousand at least. Would you say that these are people who just subscribe to you? Mm-hmm. Or would you say that you are at a point where you feel like you're building a sense of community? I think I think we're building a sense of community now with uh-huh. with Discord, with just being interactive. With the coolest thing to me is when someone steps into your ecosystem and then they meet friends, make friends in your ecosystem, and then they go on to meet in real life. And you know what I mean? That to me is the flyest thing mm-hmm. ever. So I think people are starting to connect with other people and building relationships. And so I'll be in a lot. I'll be on live on YouTube and there'd be a chat going back and forth. And I'm like, what are y'all talking? Oh, they just catching up, mm-hmm. you know. And so I think the the power of the community is 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 incredible. And so yeah, we're we're slowly building that out. Discord is a great tool for that. Um, the the YouTube chats are are cool to see like the moderators. We got like a, a team of moderators, and they start becoming friendly with each other. And then they'll, they'll hop on Instagram, and then hop off of Instagram, and you know meet each other uh, over the phone, Facetime. So the community aspect is is powerful. You know, the community aspect is powerful. So, yeah, I think, and, I, and by the way, I think that's 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 happened in the last, like, two years or so okay. is the community side, like, really cultivating that around an ethos and a set of values that people can get behind. How do you build that? I just started bringing people into the Zoom calls. So I would do a stream, and I it'd be like, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, it'd be like light like content. All right, we ain't got nothing to talk about today. What are we going to talk about? <laughs> ain't, nothing, ain't nothing trending. All right, well, uh, Open up the calls to the Patreon. Yeah. And then people will start calling in and they become the content. This is, the again, the Dave Ramsey model, mm-hmm. right? Dave Ramsey model, it's, the, it's a brilliant model because the people are the content. And so people call in, you have a big Zoom call, people arguing, discussing, talking about topics, debating, you know, and then people exchange information and meet, meet virtually like that. So that's how it really started was the Zoom calls about... Mm-hmm. About 2000, 2020 is when we started doing that, and and yeah, the Zoom calls. And in a sense, we've been able to scale it over to the Discord, you know, because it's hard to if you're a creator, it's hard to just be on a Zoom call. But a lot of people do that in, inside of Discord, where you can be live mm-hmm. from Discord and then have like a voice chat going on in the background, and people yeah. could be talking to you uh, in the background. So I think yeah, I think I think that sort of stuff is powerful. Said, I think every rapper should have his own Discord. By the way, said, everybody should have their own Discord communicating all the time. I agree. Yeah, I agree. There has to be some sense of community. There's other platforms, but Discord is definitely like easily number one in many cases. Yeah, most cases. You said specifically that the Zoom calls helped, right? Yeah. Why do you think bringing people on those calls was the start? Because you could have said a lot of different things. Yeah, I think t- two things. One, I think. Um, one people want to when when people feel heard and feel seen that's powerful for your for your for the for the, for the person on the other end mm-hmm. right so i think when people feel heard and feel seen they go wait a minute ruslan remember my name mm-hmm. ruslan remember what i'm into ruslan remembers that i'm in the chat and i'm always talking about how he don't got enough women merch and how y'all need to do leggings for women you know what i'm saying i'm kind of like oh we christians what we look like doing leggings with a big old bless god logo on the booty you know what i mean like you know so we have these little back and forths you know so uh (laughs) so i think them seeing feeling heard and seen is is powerful then i but i think the flip side is for the creator especially when you start getting some steam to see that these are actual humans and not just numbers on a screen. Because mm-hmm. if you're just seeing numbers and it's like, what is this? Well, 400 people live today. Oh, man, it's light. Because yesterday we had 600 people live. Like, psh, what's, go- what's going on? YouTube, the algorithms, you know what I mean? But if I was in front of 400 people mm-hmm. and they were sitting there just giving me their afternoon, listening to me, like, that would be nuts. The people mm-hmm. every day pull up and give me their afternoon. You know, and thousands more watch the replays and watch the clips and watch the videos. That's great. I don't think our brains could quantify that. So I think for the artist, it serves well to actually meet your people and under- know their names. You know, there's this pastor, and uh, he's a controversial pastor, but he said something really interesting. I met him. Um, he pastors a church out here, uh, or he did, called Saddleback Church. He wrote the second best-selling book at the time 
um, that sold better than the Bible. It's called Purpose Driven Life. His name is Rick Warren. Okay, so mega church celebrity pastor, the 30,000 people. You say he sold better than the Bible. <clears throat> the, bu the, the book Purpose Driven Life outsold every other book except the Bible, up to, up until that point. It's one of the best selling books of all time. Crazy. And yeah. and and uh, I was I was fortunate enough to be at a luncheon with him, and he said, um, "I'll tell you guys how to build a, a big church." So I'll tell you guys how to build a big, big, big church, but that's not really what the talk's about. The talk's going to be about how to make sure you don't fall and ruin your life. <laughs> he said, <laughs> but I'll tell you how to build a big church anyway. He said, you want to know build a big church? He said, up until my church was 1,500 members, I remembered every single person's name. Every Sunday, I would meet every single person. I would remember their name, and I would talk to them. And, I'm, and, I, and I did that, and then at, the, at like over 2,000, I, was, I just was incapable of doing it. Mm. And that's always stuck with me. Like, what if... We just really reduced it to the the most central part, which at the end of the day, it's an exchange of time and value and ideas. And we just reduced it to these are people at the end of the day. These yeah. aren't just numbers. Oh, I got a million. Views. That's a million people you touched, you know. And I think when you could quantify that even to a couple hundred, a couple thousand people that you remember, I think that's that's good for our soul as creatives to know that there's actual humans on the other side of this, and it's not just all clout and money and fame and trend, trends and all this stuff, you know. So that's been helpful for me. That's been helpful for me. Like I was in Houston, I, I, I spoke at a church, handful of people pulled up, and some of them I knew, some of them I didn't know, and it was like really cool to be like, "Yo, you're Yolanda. I know you. Like, how are you? How's your husband? Da da da. You know." And they're just f ecstatic to meet you, and but you, you kind of know each other, you know. It's a trip. That is. Yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to, if you if you ever thought about it in that, is I think that allowing your audience to be a part of your story is is another powerful component, right? Because if I hop on your live stream and you call me in, and then I don't know, we have an interesting back and forth, and mm -hmm. that clip does well, it goes viral. Now I can say like, hey, I contributed to Ruslan's yeah. story or bigger narrative, right? And I think that's the part that's also slept on is the fans want to feel like they are a part of your success. Like yeah. I, I always say, like every fan wants to feel like. Hey, if I stop paying attention to you today, you will fall off. Yep. Right. <laughs> yep. And then the dance is okay. How do I make them yeah. feel that way? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? How do I keep that keep that going? Yeah. So, yeah, because I, I I don't know. I've seen it with other artists. Where it's like I, I think one for you guys is the creative. It takes the burden of performance off of you, which is great, right? Yeah. I can still entertain without having to be the person being entertaining. Yeah. And the flip side of it is this person walks away feeling like like Hey, I helped Ruslan yeah. reach a, a another pivotal moment in his yeah. career. And the, and, and the added layer to that is when some of them then go on and become YouTubers. Yeah. Or just somebody in general. Or just somebody in general. Yeah. 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 They'll yeah. hop on. They'll be super funny. And I'm like, you got a YouTube? And they're like, nah. Like, you got to start YouTube. You're funny. You know? And they'll go do it. And some of them, was, mm. you know, 10,000, 20,000 subscribers, like, just chipping away. You know? That so, is the coolest part. Yeah, now, man. Over the years, we've had people watch and become successful artists yep. or... Mm -hmm. I mean, even people like you actually yeah. watching their channel has been really cool, right? And obviously, I watch your channel too. It's like I don't. That part is hard. Is is less spo uh, spoken about because you know how they say, "Don't try to network up, mm -hmm. network vertically." Mm -hmm. I don't know where that falls mm -hmm. in that analogy. Mm -hmm. um, did I say not ever? I meant horizontal. No, you're right. Horizontally. Yeah, yeah horizontally. horizontally. Yeah. I did horizontal. You did the hand gestures. I, said, I, said I got vertical. you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Network horizontally. Yep. That's some similar thing, but I don't so I don't know where it falls in that analogy, but I've seen it mm -hmm. just time and time again, right? You you meet someone who maybe aren't where you are in media, right? You're not necessarily better than them, but you have a bigger platform and then they might go 3x, 10x your platform in the next year or so, right? Mm -hmm. Or and then now you have a relationship Right and a connection that becomes a benefit. Mm -hmm. So it's like, especially being Indian, building these platforms in this way, you build your own industry in a way. You build your own network mm -hmm. over time mm -hmm. just by staying consistent in the same way. People are fighting to get in certain rooms still to this day, mm -hmm. right? With label execs or whoever they're trying to network with, just by building that small community you can find yourself building a network that's more powerful than you ever could have imagined because those people can get us in rooms. We've mm -hmm. gotten in rooms that <laughs> we could not get in ourselves through people mm. that were following us first and grew. Mm -hmm. What I, I mean, that, that is the power of a personal brand, right? Mm. Like yeah. Alex Hermosi kept talking about, I'm sure you follow Alex yeah, Hermosi, yeah, yeah. and he talks about like he was doing well and I think he was doing like a million dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And then he said, but he discovered uh, Kylie Jenner 
was worth a billion dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, I gotta get on his personal brand thing. I always thought it was cringe, but if if that's what it yeah, takes yeah. me to a B, a billion, let me build this thing out. You know, that's the that's that power of how, especially if you already have products. See, the, 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 the issue for us is we didn't yes. really have no products. Like, mm -hmm. we just, like, merch and music, you know? Yeah. Now we're trying to build products. I'm writing a book. I'm you know, trying to think through products, live events. And so I think if you already have a course, if you already have coaching, if you already have implementation, then, of, of course, having a bigger brand is going to help because you got a bigger net of people to, to tap in with. What does that look like for you? Obviously, you mentioned some things, the books, merch touring whether that's your show or your other show right mm -hmm. as an artist which is cool you now have that where yeah. you can integrate them somehow but have you thought of any other products that might not make sense but just what has been that process of thinking about products yeah i want to do a prayer journal um okay. just because i like writing out my prayers and i've never found a journal that like has a little structure you can go through you turn to a page little Bible verse and yeah. you just kind of like, you know what I mean? This is my prayers for the day. This is what I'm, this is who I'm praying for. This is what I'm praying for. Like I've always wanted to do that. So I think I'll probably do that soon. Um, I've, I've, I've been very passionate about like the fitness space for a long time. And so that, that, that seems so oversaturated, but I, I want to do something there. I'm not really sure yet, but I think right now it's just the book, um, the merchandise, a prayer journal. And then the bottom of the funnel is the, the Patreon. Like if I can get people to, to partner monthly, that's, that's, that's where it's at. You know, I love the prayer journal specifically out of everything you said, everything else you said are obviously things that, you know, that are there, but the specificity of a prayer journal, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of people can write a book, yeah. you know, and you can even make it about a specific topic, but a prayer journal, right? Yeah. That truly is a product that, you know, I don't know how many are out there. Not um, many. I was I was researching. Right? Not many. And not right? many good ones. And it speaks to something yeah. innately. And the scalability, yeah. right, goes beyond Ruslan. Yep. Right? Yep. At its core. So I, I, I feel like if people can find those things yeah. that are great and make sense yeah. to start where they are, but can scale past. And actually, this is, so this is the business model. And I look at what we do, everything that we do in the same way. Um, and I think a lot of industries have done better at thinking about it this way. Mm -hmm. So we now have an asset pool. Mm -hmm. You think about just the ability to get feedback, this mm -hmm. connection to audience, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And people don't realize beyond, hey, I'm getting views and streams and making money directly from them. No, it's an asset just to be able to test and get feedback mm -hmm. from these people. Oh, yeah. Right. So you can introduce a product. You can improve a product that has scalability far beyond where you could initially go. But other people who might have the money, even know how to create these products, still have to figure out, well, how can I spend money mm -hmm. just to get the feedback, just to get the feedback, just to figure out yeah. if it's good. Yeah. You can talk to your community, get on your Zoom call. Right. Hey, is this prayer journal? Is it too short? Is it too right. long? Right. Do I need to make the lines bigger? Right. Whatever that looks like. Right. And you can work through those tweaks mm -hmm. before you scale that's good and i don't know what product that means for other artists obviously and that's where the specificity really mm -hmm. um shines but i wish more people saw their audience as yeah. something like that as well yeah yeah i think the products is where it's at i think if you the moment you have something of your own and it's unique you mm -hmm. know like mr beast has his candy bars you know and obviously mm -hmm. that takes yeah. more scalability than, yeah. than, a, than a prayer journal but yeah. even doing a prayer journal it's like i think the more of those products like the the better and and what we're looking at is like diversifying the revenue streams like because we're like yo we're not going to be just out here dependent on youtube <laughs> and then the algorithm change yeah. you know what i mean or they're like yeah we don't really like christians on youtube and then they just turn it down you they know can do that and they can do now. that it's been yeah. very clear that they can do that to anybody they can do any that time. for anybody so i'm like let me let me go and diversify these revenue streams so that we're solid you know and so yeah so that i think that's where it's at if you have something at the bottom of the funnel is is going to be dope and i feel like what we might see with music i'd love to hear what you guys think about this is that that the music becomes the version of a daily live stream that the music becomes the version of an instagram post that the music becomes a top of funnel let me mm. get something clever 90 second song you know what i'm saying and then that is really the top of the funnel to get people to click into and at the bottom of it, there's some sort of cool product or something that they're selling people. Not like coaching or a course, but like something else. I can mm -hmm. see it going that way and the music just being another piece of yeah, the of I the think puzzle. it's already there. Like we've got- You think it's already there? Yeah, we've gotten flack before. Uh, it was one episode we did where I was like, yo, music is really just another piece of content. Like from a mm -hmm. consumer perspective, to the artist, for you guys, yeah. I get it, you know what I'm saying? But for consumers, 
It's no different than the YouTube video I just watched. It's no yeah. different than the movie I just watched. It's no different than the TikTok I just scrolled through. From, from my mind, because you said it earlier, it's all entertainment to us. So now it becomes about how do I take this brief, entertaining moment this person just had with me and as quickly as I can push them to something that will net me a bigger return. Like I think I think we're already there. Wow. I just don't think the the artist community mentally has caught up yeah. to it because it's a it's a hurtful thing for a lot of artists to hear. Like to a consumer, your your music is no different than a TikTok. But if you were to go ask like people in your life yeah. who have absolutely nothing to do with music, yeah. like about it, they yeah. they view it that way. You know what I'm saying? Sheesh. He said we're already there. <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> But here's something that I, I that clicked when you spoke, because yes, in many ways we're already there. You look at the industry as a whole. For years, they've always looked at music as a lost leader. We're going to mm -hmm. create this this fan base, this marketing funnel through music, and then we're going to go tour. People mess up because they don't look at touring as a separate thing. That's just shows. Mm -hmm. Everybody does shows. How do we get people to come to this event? Was the music? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And good. we happen to perform it. So. It's always been there as a model, but I think something that I thought about when you said it, and it might be even more so what you're thinking about, is the idea of I have this product that's not necessarily in the typical artist economy, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at music as a viable way to sell it, mm -hmm. almost from a jump, mm -hmm. right? Or as just another marketing avenue yeah. versus I'm being an artist and trying to build my way up out of this and build stability. It's mm -hmm. like, no, I have artistic skills. I want to build this. And then I'm just going to do music from the jump specifically to, to somehow lead back to this, to this community yeah. or yeah. to expand yeah. on this community or create another brand connection point. I think it will get there at some yeah. point. Yeah. The best version of that we've already had are jingles, right? Mm -hmm. For TV shows. Mm -hmm. I meant for commercials and things like that. Uh -huh. I think, but I do believe because of the level of connection that music creates, mm -hmm. right? And brand affinity that music creates, you will find more people doing that. It's why Pepsi, Coke, all these brands will do a festival that have nothing to do with music. Mm -hmm. Like, like, why are we doing this? Because we're trying to tap into culture. Mm. And there's going to be more Alex Hermosi types that, like, oh man, this brand thing is a real thing. I get it now. Mm. Like, instead of just making transactional pricing, um, like, uh, trades, it's like, there's gonna be there's gonna be that next level. Oh snap! This music yeah. thing. There's something to that. Let's figure out how to yeah, yeah that's <laughs> how, to, how to do that. Yeah, because the replay value. The replay, the replay value. value. You watch a YouTube video once. You listen to a podcast yeah. maybe twice if it's yeah. really good. You listen to your favorite song hundreds, hundreds thousands of times. Of times yeah. man. Consuming my brand for fun. Yeah. No, this is a really cool thing that I think about when I think about that. So I was watching Honey Eye Shrunk the Kids. The second or third one with my mm -hmm. daughter, because she had never seen any of those. And I'm watching it. And they were eating breakfast. I can't be, uh, remember what cereal. It might have been like Fruit Loops on the table. And I just realized as a marketer, how crazy is that? Mm. You paid for this ad like 30 years ago for this mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. But now, like 30 years later... My daughter's getting advertised yeah. too, wow. right? I'm getting a reminder. Man, I haven't had Fruit Loops in a, uh, in a while. Should I <laughs> wow. have some Fruit Loops? Like that's a crazy that's thing crazy. to be able to have yeah, that yeah. type of placement yep. and, and lasting value. Yes. So being able to do something like that in a song, yeah. right? And people yeah. are playing it and still have that connection in some way. Wow, it's crazy. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Let me ask you guys a question. This might be off topic, but I'm really curious. You guys' thoughts. Do you think that ideologies uh, will get in the way? of people viewing everything the way we just described it, right? The false dichotomy mm. between art and commerce, all these things. If things are being pushed more and more to a socialistic Marxist paradigm where capitalism's bad, you know what I mean? This whole yeah. thing. But when 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 business people sit down, like we all, everybody talks like this, we understand it. But yeah, yeah. if there's out, out, outside, <laughs> yeah. the, whether it's like the World Economic Forum, I'm not trying to get super conspiratorial, I'm not that guy, but like the World Economic <laughs> Forum, like you'll own nothing and you'll love it. You yeah. know what I mean? Or like the push to like, hey, we got to like, the earth is going to burn in, by 2030, you know, and this whole, all this stuff. And so people then start viewing the world through a different lens. Do you mm -hmm. think that's what may be impacting some artists' approach? in terms of the false dichotomies because yeah. if i'm approaching this and i got this like capitalism's bad 
you know, there's a, there's a limited piece of the pie and then every, you know, the pies versus like, if you're looking at it from an abundance mindset, you're like, yo, the, the, pie, the pie is infinite. Everybody can win, right? Do you think that's what keeps certain artists from wanting to go all in and learn the business and learn what you're talking about and learn the products and learn all these things and view it in what it is, which is an, it's an exchange of value at the end of the day, yeah. you know? Do you think the ideologies are, are impacting how people operate? They have business? to. Yeah, I you think know? so. They have to. Yeah, I, I think the... I think the glorification of the struggling artists is one of the worst things that happen to the creative community. And even though it's been happening for a long Starving time. You know yeah, the, the, but the glorification of it is, 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 is made it cool. Like I've literally been at shows and events and things and you see artists congregating and relating over the fact that they aren't doing certain things. And I'm mm-hmm. like, that's such a weird thing. They're like, man, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't need to manage. I don't need to, I don't need to hire somebody for marketing. That's crazy. And it's like, man, that's not something to, mm. to brag about because one, you are willingly putting yourself behind in the race, mm. right? Because for every non-artist that think that way, there's one that's like, man, forget that. I'm about to go do what I got to do. You know what I'm saying? Mm. To get that. And then they, they look down on those artists. Like the artist community as a whole, I think, holds artists back because they will actively look down on artists who are trying to break out of the struggling artist narrative. And they, they almost get like villainized. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, and then on top of that, there are there's always going to be someone that is willing to learn the information that you're not willing to learn Mm -hmm. and now you're hoping that hey this person figured it out they can go in one direction and help me or they can go in another direction and finesse me and now you're putting all that power and hoping that they take the right path but a lot of people don't like there's been people finessing artists in the music industry for decades you know Mm. and so it's like it's hard to know when you're being hunted when you don't understand what the bait looks like right Mm. like it's it's hard to, to 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 maneuver out of certain situations when you don't even understand some of the, the simple things about the situation. So I definitely think so. Like I've met lots of artists where I could be like, I can say like, hey man, the way you think about this is, is what's holding you back. Like you are, let's just say actively not running ads because you're afraid that if another artist sees it, they're gonna think you're cheating. I'm like, who cares? Like that mm-hmm. other artist isn't buying your music or supporting you anyway. Yeah. And then I, I don't think enough, I think artists put too much merit into the words of the creative community and not enough merit in the words of the consumer community. Cause, wow. Because the consumers have been telling us for years how we want to see you make TikToks. Yeah. We, we love it when you go live. We like when you when you work on merch. I like when you sell me stuff. Like I like when my favorite artists mm-hmm. attempt to sell me things, but then the artists would ignore it and be like, nah, that's not right. I'm not, like, who I'm, said not, that? I'm not keeping it real. Yeah, I'm not keeping it real. But it's like, yeah. who said that? The consumers didn't say that. Other yeah. artists said that. Wow. Other artists who are more than likely, also not where you want to be. Mm-hmm. You know? Wow. The, the subconscious Sheesh, mind. man. The subconscious mind is so powerful. Yeah. Right? If you believe that all rich people are evil, why would you want to be rich? Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's important that you try to figure out where your limiting beliefs come from, mm-hmm. where all of your beliefs come from, and then trace it back mm-hmm. and try to determine who benefits most mm. from this. Mm. Right? So, Corey talked about the music industry finessing artists for all these years because again as we even alluded to earlier right if the business people value the money the artist believes that the money actually devalues their work i should be it makes it easier for me to extract that value with less give me give me, give me my 85 percent artist exactly wow. <laughs> exactly so me as a business entity right if i'm going to get a mini conspiracy on it with it, right? If I'm the establishment, right, and I'm trying to maintain as much value and keep new people from coming up the ladder and being a threat to me, the best thing that I can do is to get them to feel pride in their current position, mm. right? So I can make you feel pride of being with being a broke artist. Mm. I can make you feel pride for being in the hood, from the hood, and now you're always talking about where you're from as a point of pride as if that makes you better than somebody else, mm. even though a lot of that mentality might be keeping you back and becoming the ultimate threat to me, mm-hmm. right? So like a lot of artists get caught in that cycle, and the funny part about it is it's in complete incongruence with what artists say they believe. Wow. Money does not create value for art, yeah. right? That's what we say yeah. as creatives, right? The creativity is value, the art is value. So if it has nothing to do with that equation, you making more or less should not impact that equation, mm. right? The work and the value there 
is there. If somebody misunderstands that, that should be their issue, but mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with you and the value of your work. Yeah. You know what's, you know what's the trip, man, is that even at this level that I've been doing this for this long, I approach YouTube totally different to music that I even need some of this deprogramming, hmm. mm -hmm. which is why I think what y'all do is so powerful. Because I think it's like, even at this level, I'm still like, it's my baby. You know what I mean? <laughs> the other day, me and Zach were sitting there and, we, and I was like, man, it's like, it was like Thursday. And I was like, I think I'm just going to release this song next Friday. Like, I'm not going to do a big pre-save. He's like, do it. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it. You know, usually it'd be like six weeks out. Like, you know? <laughs> and it's, and it's, and it's, wow. That's so interesting, man. I was, I was talking to a friend. I'll tell you who it is offline. And we were talking about an A&R that he's connected with that a very major artist is connected with. And we found out that this A&R was skimming off the budget, mm -hmm. which I was like, yo, they can do that? And he's like, yes. Like I found out that they was, you know, they was like letting us spend the money however we wanted to, but they was just skimming off the, the marketing budget, you know? And I was like, dang, that's crazy. And then another major artist was signed to under the same A&R and was signed to three labels total. The artist was signed to three labels. Yeah, totally. and I'll tell you who it is offline because I want to, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then he was like, yeah, like, I mean, my man was in a 500K home. And I was like, wait a minute. He was in a 500K? I thought he bought that for his family. He's like, no, that was his home up until like recently. Because mm. he, and then when he finally pulled away from the situation, he was able to level up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But this a and got let go. He became a vice president of one of the biggest labels. He got fired. He got let go. And this stuff happens where people will go into people's budget and take them. But if you're an artist and it's, and it's all about the art and it's all about the, you know what I mean? You, uh, I guess Why I'm supposed to be broke. To it, yeah, I guess right? I'm supposed to be broke. I yeah. guess I'm supposed to just have a. Supposed to be a struggle. Right, right. Supposed to be a struggle, right? Like, what's, uh, you know, and so that's that's a trip when you when you talk about that. And it made me think of that story. And I was like, yo, that's crazy. Because if that's your mindset, someone else could easily take advantage of you and or just have you in a messy business situation. Man, it's always so great talking to you, man. Offline, online, it's always great talking to you. I appreciate you having this conversation with us today. I want to close it on this topic. How has how has family impacted how you look at your business, but even more so how you navigated your career as an artist? I think if I, if like foundationally family, my wife, is the one who told me to quit my job. <laughs> I've shared that story with you, you know. We was coming back from South by Southwest, driving cross country. We stopped in New Mexico. Uh, I could sense that my job was kind of getting tired of me taking so much time off. I called my wife, I said, hey, babe, maybe we should pray about quitting, you know, and, and putting in our two week notice when I get back. She was like, there's nothing to pray about. You need to come home and put in your two week notice. You need to quit, you know, so. My wife is the one that pushed me towards going full full fledged, you know. So I think foundationally that, and this is her as a stay at home mom with a six month old, you know. But like, not yeah. working for it. She was staying at home, really believing we were going to get it, you know. And so I would say foundationally that, like, my wife is oftentimes believes bigger for me than I do, you know. Um, and then I think I, I think man, it's 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 this it's this paradigm that's this hard to articulate, but. When you don't have external motivators, you got all the time in the world. But when you have external motivators like children that are depending on you, your time is, is limited, mm -hmm. right? So, so the biggest thing I, could, I, I try to articulate to people is the future version of you and your future wife and kids are depending on the current version of you to make great decisions. And if you and, and that thir that thirty year old, thirty five year old, forty year old version of you is 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 like, yo, f clean this crap up, figure <laughs> this out, go work on your trauma, get help if you need help. Like, don't don't overeat. Like like get your life together because the thirty five, forty year old version of you is gonna deal with the with the decisions, good or bad. And so the family is the, is the real tangible reality of that. Like my my two year old and my eight year old. Uh, what was the line in Belly? Uh, DMX said, "Shorty can't eat no books, no. B. <laughs> Shorty, my kids can't yeah. eat no art, yo. Yeah. You know what I mean? They yeah. can't eat uh, 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 affirmation from other struggling artists. Like that doesn't. Mm. That's that's not a commodity. That don't put food on the table. Yeah. You know. And so I was fortunate in that I had a, an amazing wife that believed in me, 
more so than I believed in myself and was allowing me, like we were getting our crap together, but then she was also believing in me to take risk. And it was that balance, you know? And so I think family changed everything. So my, my advice to most people would be like, yo, the future version of you, your future kids are depending on you to not be an idiot. Like get your, get your stuff together. And if you can figure it out when you have the time without the external motivators, like hustle as if you have kids, hustle as if you have a wife, hustle as if people are depending on you. If you can figure that out in your early 20s or whenever before you have kids, then by the time you're there with a family, it's going to be great. Oftentimes people that it don't click. It just you just don't understand the, the tricky thing about the present moment is that it feels so permanent. Right, like mm. your present reality feels so permanent. This is like, but it's not cement. This is not cement. What happened? Like, so things could change in a year. You know, things change in a couple of years. I mean, you just had kids recently, right? Like that thing. A lot of things change very quickly. They change. You know, yeah. and so it's like if people could understand that that external, when that external motivator comes, it changes things. Hustle as if that that's already there. Work as if that's already there. Have a plan and, and work as if that's already there. Because when it's there, you have less time. You know. So now. We're, we're fortunate in that we do a four four day work week. You know, we come in Monday through Thursday. We hit it hard Monday through Thursday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're off. You know, um, that's a luxury that because we grinded our faces off the last two years that we got to be able to be in this place. Like people don't think like that, you know. Mm. And so now that Zach Zach just had a baby, you know, he has a three day weekend. You know, and nice. uh, it's 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 dope. You know, and 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 so like that that's the like people need to think about these things for the next season. You know, I, I break it down like this. And, and the, the, the Bible talks a lot about sowing to reap. Right. And, and God created this like sowing and reaping universe cause and effect. Right. And so the way I look at it is you got to work to eat. Uh, Second Thessalonians says a man who not who 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 not work ought not eat. Right. You got to work to eat. But then you also got to sow to reap when you work to eat. That's for the here and now. You're struggling. You ain't got no money, man. You better get on Uber Eats. You better go deliver something. You better, you better get some money now. Right. But the sow to reap is for the next season. I'm not sowing, you know, apple trees to get them tomorrow. I'm sowing for apple trees to get them in the next season, you know, or years, years removed. So it's living in this reality of I got to work to eat now, but I also got to sow to reap for the next season. And so I'm writing a book. I'm sowing to reap for the next season. I'm working on an album. That's the next season. That's not, I'm not paying my bills with the book this month. <laughs> it's the next season. I'm paying my bills with the things I did six months ago, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, work to eat, sow to reap. That's a little thing I got in my book. I love it. I love it. Wow. Well, this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. It's been a pleasure, a pleasure to have you on and for you to have us. Right? Yeah, man. Thank In you guys for case. coming. I'm Brand Man Sean. I'm Corey. And I'm Ruslan. <laughs> and we out. Peace. <laughs> Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play and courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members, and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.